Garzon, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure, of course. And yes, as you all know, we review uh, our policies in a two-year cycle, and they come up every quarterly uh, MAC OAC meeting. Uh, but the live date for those updates and revisions is is used to twice a year and is now once a year. So it's fairly important. It's a big update and big revision to the system. And I think this year we have 38 policies total that are going into effect to last. So uh, Dr. Garzon and I worked a little bit together and uh, we selected uh, roughly 13 or so policies. We want to make this a productive time for you. Yeah. And I, the other thing I would say is I, I think all the policy updates are important. So we all we are relying on the educational process in your agencies and the updates that you do so that you get a full review of all the updates. But as Kevin mentioned, we're calling out highlighting the the 13 or 14 we think are most important and want to bring some some valuable topics to the to the medics and EMTs out there to look at. All right, let's get so, this going, okay? All yeah. right, the first the first policy I had in mind was uh, and we're just going to go in numerical order is uh, 2033 determination of death and there's just a couple policy changes in there. Um, so the big thing with this policy, a couple of things to make. One is that uh, we added language so it applied not just to EMTs and paramedics, but also emergency medical responders and uh, public safety personnel who can make a, a visual inspection of obvious signs of death, determination of death, like things like, you know, decapitation and, and things like that. And we also cleaned up the language a little bit, made it simpler, made it cleaner around defining rigor mortis and liver mortis. Rigor mortis now is written as physical examination with rigidity jaw and one, and one limb. And liver mortis is the disco discoloration appearing on dependent parts of the body after death as a result of cessation of circulation. Uh, strangulation of blood and settling blood by gravity. So a little bit uh, more simple than the language that was there before. Uh, yeah, and that, that was it for that policy that I have, Kevin. Yeah, those are my keynotes as well, uh, emphasizing that a systole is confirmed in two leads, making sure that that happens. Every now and then we'll see just a one lead confirmation of a systole, make sure that it's in two leads. So yeah, that, that's, a good, that's a good coverage of that policy. Um, the next one, which I mentioned in the introduction, is 2521, which is APOT. Sure. So APOT is an acronym short for uh, Ambulance Patient Offload Times, which we uh, call wall times, basically. And we know, obviously, in Sacramento County and many other LEMSAs around the state, uh, wall times are a significant problem, and they tie up a lot of uh, manpower, people hours on the wall in hospitals waiting to transfer care. A couple of years ago, uh, at the state level, EMSA came up with some metrics to find this so we can track this and get a, a, a realistic, accurate sense of, of how, what the impact of that is. So APOT1 and APOT2 are metrics defined by the state, which we've been tracking for a couple of years. We report within our system and also up to the state. APOT1 is the, called the 90th percentile. Like what's the amount of time that 90% of your calls get transfer of care? And the target for that is 20 minutes. Sacramento tends to vary somewhere between 30 and 42, 30 and 45, depending on how busy the season is. So about 90% of our calls, you get handover transfer of care within 30 to 45 minutes. And that's not the target we'd like, which is 20 minutes. Um, APOT2 is the percentage of cases and that are turned over in, a, in certain blocks of time. So we look at the percentage that are certain turned over Within 20 minutes, the percentage that are turned over 20 to 60 minutes, the percentage that are turned over of 60 minutes and, and looking at that hospital wide. And then one of the things that we did in Sacramento County is I, I think uh, say pot three, which we went to affect this past year. And that's really a, a, a sum, a, a cumulative number of minutes and hours that medics are spending on all beyond 20 minutes, right? It's reasonable to do that 20 minute transfer of care, but anything in excess of 20 minutes is above the target. And we're adding that up to kind of put an hours cost to this. How many person hours, how many medic hours is it costing our EMS system to be on the wall? Um, and so that's the third APOT mechanism. I've actually discovered fairly recently that EMSA is tracking something similar. They're actually putting a dollar figure to those hours, right? So um, given the different pay scales and we thought let's just accumulate hours and agencies can figure out for themselves how much that's actually costing them. But uh, 
at the state level, I think they're actually putting a dollar value. So the state has a, a similar concept or similar metric. And, and that obviously gets discussed at administrative meetings about how we manage and respond to the, to the wall time problem that we have in Sacramento County. Uh, the other thing that I would point out about this, this policy is it does have some clinical relevance to the medics. The, the bottom half of the policy outlines the medic's responsibility while you're on the wall, um, what medications can be given, how communication should happen when, when you escalate, when you exceed those 20 minutes, get to six minutes, who you call, and really most importantly, what the responsibility is to the patients or continued care, because you have to document continued vital sign, patient deteriorates, you have to take them, right? We're still responsible for those patients while we're waiting to turn over care. All right, paramedic accreditation, uh, 4,400. Um, there were a couple things in there, but I, you know, the one thing that I didn't know, and, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, and I might be wrong, that a paramedic can start this process for reaccreditation as, full, as early as five months. I, I think you hit upon it really is the fact that you can start this process early and, and, and don't wait for the last minute. All right, uh, here we go. Let's move into some of the treatment policies. But 8027 was uh, just a conglomeration of moving together of two policies. And this is a symptomatic nerve agent exposure. Um, what did we do here, Fernando? Right, so we, um, we had a, a clinical care policy, 8027 ner nerve agent exposure, but we also had a skills policy in 8826, which was the vacation administration for the Mark I or Duo Dotes. Um, Reminder that this is not a standing order policy, that th these policies were developed at the time that bioterrorism became a, a significant risk in our, in our 20 years ago. Uh, we don't tend to think about it now because there hasn't been anything recent, but you, you know the realities of the world these days and these can come up. So, um, the, the, I would point out that many times with these policies in place in EMS and in the hospital setting that these auto injectors have been used appropriately more than appropriately, usually due to fear of the responders. So if, if you know, if we look nationally at when the use of one administration in this country, it's usually been um, uh, people who jumped the gun out of fear. They were in the, the real terrorist situation. So this is the, the this policy comes active when there's a credible threat that's been verified, and it requires a base order contact or something in the system that says yes, this has something's gone on, and you have to be prepared to use this policy because there may be. Um, uh, um, chemical weapons involved in response. So it, it's base contact or other um, EMS leadership, a trigger to implement this policy. That's a key thing. Yeah. And like you said, they're, they're not to be used prophylactically either. It's not, okay, we have a nerve agent and I might get exposed. Let me go ahead and give this to myself or to my partner. Exactly. Uh, this is when symptoms have onset. Um, so 8044 spinal motion restriction. Um, it is, uh, there are other videos we've done together. Uh, Dr. Schatz and you and I shot a video together. So um, that's also available for folks to see. Um, but just the key aspects of this, that it's midline uh, neck or back pain and that that requires a good exam. It does, you need to actually palpate the spine. You need to be searching for pain. Um, and then um, what we're seeing less of, which I'm encouraged by, is, is that penetrating trauma is not coming in anymore with the caller. I think that our good friend, Dr. Schatz, helped us answer that question once and for all uh, with the help of the American College of Surgeons. And so any penetrating trauma, shooting or stabbing, uh, doesn't really even matter. That It doesn't matter that if there's neurologic um, compromise at that point, the cord is transected, the damage is done, and the caller and board aren't going aren't gonna to help that. I think that that's part of it. But I want to spend a moment just talking about the application of the collar and the use of the gurney. Um, so in this case that I took in last night, uh, an individual involved in a vehicle accident, pretty high rate of speed, pretty uninjured actually, did have some midline neck pain, which is good. So the application of collar was appropriate, but she came in sitting up. How should paramedics transport somebody who are not gonna use a flat or a board, uh, and they're going to use the gurney uh, to, to assist with spinal motion restriction, and they apply a collar, how should the patient be transported and then moved over from the gurney? Yeah. 
Uh, so all the all the medical literature, trauma literature shows at first the spinal motion restriction to really be effective and fully effective, the patient needs to be flat. I mean, that's really the bottom line that these upright transported in C collars, if, if there is a stable fracture you're trying to stabilize, the upright position does not work. So what we're really trying to stabilize is the potential possibility of an unstable fracture and create neurologic compromise with even little motion. And, uh, and so that's why it's really critical to have them flat. Okay. Yeah, I just really wanted to to bring that out. Um, uh, and you know, if they if they happen to have, and this does happen from time to time, you have someone who's really combative, uh, and that they just can't safely apply a collar. Um, it's going to lead to potentially more harm than good in that patient. So the one big uh, change that we did make on the upgrade in this is that a special note added for those combative patients that. I'll read it because it's important that the wording, right? Um, if attempting to apply SMR to a combative patient would cause further detriment, um, abort the procedure and document in the EPCR, notify EF on arrival running indications for SMR, but inability to apply due to combative patient. And again, it's uh, it's important to really uh, uh, mobilize or, or when you have a high risk, but you know all situations are not like that. And sometimes it creates more risk with a combative patient to the med, to the medicine. So this gives you a now to use your clinical judgment in those very complex EMS situations that we face. And, um, it's not just notifying the department, but it's also making good note of it in your narrative uh, or in your electronic medical record. Um, so there's key things that we do that are applicable and there's key things we don't do that are applicable as well. So pertinent positives, pertinent negatives, make sure there's good documentation of that as well. So um, let's move on to 8065, which is hemorrhage. TXA is, it has a very specific purpose. We use it in uncontrolled hemorrhage. Uh, there is an or statement in there as well, which is signs of significant bleeding, uh, which is a pulse greater than 120. Uh, with significant bleeding uh, and, uh, and and inability to control that hemorrhage with either a tourniquet, direct pressure, something like that. But um, some providers that watch this may may know that that you know TXA in other parts of the country are, are beginning to be used for things like um, um, uh, postpartum hemorrhage and and epistaxis and things like that. And there are discussions happening in this state as well. But at this point, TXA is used for one and only one purpose, and that's uncontrolled hemorrhage from trauma. Absolutely. And thank you for calling that out. I think that's a fairly important thing because the, the one review we did make to this policy, so this policy used to be called hemorrhage and trauma. And then, you know, with discussion and things that people brought up from the field is, as you know, sometimes you see hemorrhage from a non-traumatic cause that's fairly significant. And, uh, you, you know, we have those... Uh, AV fistulas that sure that diabetics uh, are the people in dialysis have, and when those bleed, they can bleed very heavily. Sometimes we have people on anticoagulants um, that have an ulcer on their leg that may open up, you know, without any specific trauma. There's all sorts of reasons to have some heavier bleeding that's not specifically from trauma. So there's aspects of this policy in terms of the tourniquet and the direct pressure and all of that that address non-traumatic causes as well. Um, and so the language we did add to this policy, and I'll read it again um, verbatim because it's, it's useful to know what the wording is, is we added another sentence that says, while most life-threatening bleeding um, is as a result of trauma, hemorrhage control strategies and sections of this policy also apply to non-traumatic hemorrhage, including but not limited to bleeding AV shunts, non-traumatic bleeding in patients on anticoagulants. So in other words, many of the, of the hemorrhage control strategies in the policy can obviously be used in traumatic bleeding. But we may revise that, right? They're doing other control trials for using it in other situations, but that's, those studies show a benefit, we will potentially implement it in Sacramento. Uh, what do you think about 8067 septic shock? This is one that comes up quite frequently. I spent yesterday um, with one of our local agencies just talking about septic shock. So what kinds of things are we talking about in this policy? I didn't see a ton of changes, but maybe some reemphasis of some things. Yeah, the one the one minor change that we made is to specifically call out to provide uh, supplemental oxygen to maintain Sats over ninety four percent 
Um, and that was probably not in the policy, but that's kind of an obvious no-brainer to make sure that someone's oxygenation is adequate. The other thing that I would like to stress and point out in May, May uh, is that the, every, every patient who has a primary impression of, of sepsis, anyone who you suspect of having sepsis should get at least 500 cc's of normal, patient, no, normal saline bolus, everyone, because the treatment for sepsis is fluids and antibiotics, fluid, fluids, 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 and antibiotics. the antibiotics they can in the hospital. But the one thing that we can do in the pre-hospital setting to initiate therapy is to give them IV fluids. Obviously, if they're also hypertensive, then you can give additional 500 cc boluses of fluids and root. But the key thing to stress is that every patient should get that first 500 started um, and, and, um, and infusing before arrival to the, to the hospital when possible. And, and thank you for pointing that out because I, I do think that that's uh, an opportunity for improvement that, that we have. Uh, and I and I think that that uh, the providers are waiting. We've been trained, right? Since I was a paramedic, we're trained that we treat low blood pressure with fluid, and we wait for that low blood pressure. Sepsis is a different animal uh, altogether. Um, that there are um, perfusion derangements uh, and a hypoperfusion happening at the tissue level and the microcirculation level already before the blood pressure drops, and the treatment for that is fluid. Uh, and so even with a normal blood pressure, um, and notice that the policy doesn't call out someone who is uh, volume overloaded or is end-stage renal disease or anything like that, that that 500 cc should still be given. We have tools in the hospital to handle those situations. Uh, and it's important to get that first 500 cc's on board if you're suspecting se septic shock, because it really does make a difference. Yeah. yeah, it saves lives. It saves lives, absolutely. And one final note that in sepsis protocol now, we can use waveform capnography as one of the criteria to identify sepsis. So if you have waveform capnography available, a reading less than 25 can be used as one of the criteria after you've already identified a confirmed or suspected presence of infection. 8801 per crike, um, percutaneous cricothyrotomy. So, um, we have not done this much in this county, um, and there are good tools that have been developed, but this is just a chance to reemphasize uh, some key points. And, um, and I brought up about the complete airway obstruction and making sure that folks know that. Um, acknowledging full well that that's sometimes hard to even know in the pre-hospital environment, right? Without a bronch, you may not know that there's a complete airway obstruction, but if you suspect a complete airway obstruction, that you should go to different techniques. So, um, sure. So, and I think the the solutions on this go around were fairly minor. We cleaned up a little language to try and make it clear. But I would like to stress the points, the revisions we made in time before last, which is kind of separated it between the procedure itself, the needle cricothyroidotomy, and the ventilation that follows. Okay. So you we have contraindications for the procedure. Don't do it in a conscious patient. Uh, don't do it with a big anterior neck hematoma or massive sub-Q emphysema. It's like, if you have that, that's going to be effective. It's going to be very difficult to be effective and accurately get in the space that, that you're trying to get into to ventilate with. So that those are the contraindications for the procedure. And then as Kevin mentions, is the, the contraindications to jet ventilation. So once you have that that uh, uh, emergency airway established, how do you ventilate the patient? The classic one is through this jet ventilation, which, because the challenge is it's such a small passage to get oxygen in or to get air in mm -hmm. that uh, jet ventilation tends to be the most effective. The problem, if you have complete airway obstruction above that, all that pressure goes down to the lungs and there's a high incidence of barotrauma and, and pneumothorax. So the idea with this procedure when using jet ventilation is that you have a partial obstruction, a swollen epiglottis or partially obstructing the body and that the pressure, excess pressure can be vented out to the top. So you get less barotrauma. So when you suspect or have full airway obstruction, the risk of pneumothorax is quite high. So your options for ventilation in that case 
are high flow intermittent jet, uh, high flow intermittent ventilation that that some machines or, or even just a BVM as much as BVM such all tight opening is going to be limited it, at least it's some ventilation for someone who may not have been breathing and had a total obstruction before 8827 12 lead EKGs Right, so the, the wording up, uh, update here is a, it's a result of um, a review of cases that we saw. Some of them were um, uh, things that were seen that were not STEMIs. And so a lot of those came into a couple categories. One of them are EKGs with wandering baselines. They're not good quality EKGs. And many of those are done in the back of a moving ambulance with a shaking patient. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is we saw some uh, STEMI EKGs were called stroke alerts and they were the fourth or fifth EKG done on that patient during that EMS transport. So they did one in the in, on scene initially, it did not read STEMI and it either the medics decided to repeat it or it was done automatically by the, by the monitor. So what the clarification here is to emphasize a couple of points. First of all, with STEMI care, time is of essence. So we look at the time from arrival on, at, at the patient bedside to the when the EKG is done. So if you have someone who's who you suspect of having chest pain of, of cardiac etiology, do that chest do that uh, EKG as soon as possible. But do one good quality EKG, preferably where you first meet and see the patient, because that determines the, the potential destination for this patient. If it's a STEMI, treat it as a STEMI and show the STEMI bird and get it transported. If it's not a STEMI it's, and you've done your EKG, you really don't need to repeat it unless there's a real status change on the patient. Um, so the language that we put in, and I'll read it here, is obtain one high quality EKG as soon as possible. As soon as possible is important to patient care and accurate diagnosis. Repeat EKGs can be performed if there is a change in the patient's clinical presentation, but otherwise pre-hospital serial EKGs are not indicated to high incidence of false alerts. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that stresses the point. Yes, and, and the key is, is that um, I think sometimes we wait to get that 12 lead. There's an urgency to move, slowing down just a little to get enough data because that data is going to potentially change your destination, change your alerts, change a lot of stuff. So getting that 12 lead ideally right where the patient sits before they move, getting a good quality one, and then knowing if that's a STEM or not, transmitting it as soon as you can. Keeping tension off the cables, which means that that mass of cables, putting it in their lap and so there's no tension on the cables, making sure our pads are applied, even shaving if the person has excess hair so we get good contact. All those things are, are key elements to getting that single good quality 12 lead, which will give us the best data and help us know uh, where we're going to take our patients. One other thing I, I would point out about STEMI care, that, that's a new update, um, and, and I may as well mention it here too. Uh, this is agreement of our CI center cardiologists who were requesting, if at all possible, for when you have a STEMI patient, avoid placing the IV in the right hand or the right wrist, because that's using this. You should, most many of our, our PCI centers use that site to access the artery to do the catheterization. <laughs> If at all possible, for when you have a STEMI patient, avoid placing the IV in the right hand or the right wrist. Very key. Thank you. And thanks for adding that. I think it does help our cardiologists. Okay, we've got like four more and just a, a few more minutes together. Um, we should be able to get through these okay. Um, 8830, superglottic airways. Um, talk to us about the addition of EMTs and the addition of EMT basic scope and if their providers are allowing their EMTs to put in a superglottic airway, and what happened to king tubes? Like, are those a thing anymore? 
Well, as you know, and we've done this before in this demo, um, we've transitioned to iGels, basically. We added iGels a couple of years ago. Um, some providers, depending on time of inventory and supplies and, and training, we had both iGels and KingTubes to allow some latitude for the provider agencies, depending on what they wanted to use or where they were in their speed transition. But now with enough time, it's time to, I, I think iGels are, are the preferred device uh, many studies and the feedback we've had from ACs that have been using iGels prefer them over king tubes. So again, trying to keep things simple, we've removed king tubes from the superglottic airway options. And we, so we namely have iGels. The other big change to this policy is, as Kevin mentions, is that we've added, we've added iGels for EMTs, specifically as an advanced airway in cardiac arrest for patients over 15. So that's, that's the language in there. And so now EMTs that have appropriate training, provision approval from their, from their employers, their provider agencies can have that in their optional uh, airway management skill for cardiac arrests. Excellent. I think this was a really good, um, this is a change that really was consistent across the country. Uh, lots of good mm -hmm. literature's come out about um, survival, neurologically intact survival using a, an IGEL versus using intubation. All right, uh, 8833 VADS, um, so ventricular assist devices. Um, more and more patients seem to be um, showing up in Sacramento uh, with, these, with these devices, and we have some VAD receiving centers. I just wanted to um, see if you would mind um, kind of making some, uh, reemphasizing some points and things you changed here if you did make any changes. Sure. And, you know, this, again, another bit of policy because we, we have in the historically had so few ventricular assist device patients. Just as a reminder, these ventricular assist devices create a continuous flow. They're inserted into the patient's body, of course, and they're meant to augment or replace a, a failing heart. And so the heart is still there and still beating, but it doesn't have enough forward output. So these ventricular assist devices create forward blood flow. So many times patients don't have a palpable pulse. Um, they'll still have a hard contraction in the heart, sometimes contributes a certain percentage of forward blood flow, but it's the ventricular system that's keeping the patient alive. So the, the one subtle change that we made to this policy is before the language said defibrillation and cardioversion is not indicated, right? So you can defibrillate or, or cardiovert these patients. We wanted to be a little clearer than that, and, and we changed that language to now read derelation and cardioversion are indicated for shockable rhythms. In other words, in your assessment of these patients, if you find that they have a shockable rhythm, trying to restart the heart into a, a rhythm may actually produce some forward blood flow that benefits the patient. So if you see a shockable rhythm in a VA patient, shock it, basically. Okay, and these patients, again, many of them don't have blood pressures. That should not be a shock. Um, they won't have pulse oximeter, pulse oximeter readings sometimes that you can pick up. That shouldn't be a shock um, to you either. Pardon the pun, talking about defibrillation and shock. Um, but anyway, it, should, it shouldn't surprise you. Um, so, okay, yeah, so we can shock shockable rhythms uh, even if they have a ventricular assist device, I think is the key take home point. All right. Okay. Um, we changed three uh, pediatric policies as well. Um, we'll talk about two of them. Um, uh, the pediatric anaphylaxis policy, 9002. Um, we just made a, one small change there, right? Uh, but it's an important change. Yeah, so we uh, specifically called out non-invasive ventilation, uh, CPAP or BiPAP, which were previously available only to adult patients, is now available to patients over 12 years old. And so it's, it's mentioned in the anaphylaxis policy and is cross-referenced with the non-invasive ventilation policy, which is 8829, but yeah. Yeah, so making sure that you're familiar with 8829, uh, both the indications and contraindications, uh, and I call out contraindications when you can't use um, non-invasive ventilation, but uh, we use it a lot in the emergency department. Five, 5060, hospital diversion, um, is the last policy, and I don't know why I took that out of numerical order, probably because I just didn't pick up on it. Verifying receiving status of the destination uh, upon leaving the scene. Can you kind of just discuss, um, um, and so that we have pretty good, pretty good understanding of, um, of the intent here? 
Right. So um, this the the updates to this policy came out of a number of cases where uh, patients were transported to hospitals that had diversion. Um, and so we have an existing process for hospitals to put an EM resource uh, and notify of closures that they may have, CT scanner down, cath lab unavailable, divert, you know, close to all traffic, because internal disaster, all of those settings. And of course that needs to be monitored by our providers and by dispatch, but sometimes things change in the status. And so that was the reason for the changes. The additions to doc are now says, Medics will verify receiving status of destination facility upon receiving the scene. Often, I mean, for, for calls, for, that's easy to do, obviously, if you're already making a courtesy call to notify of arrival, or if you're calling in a trauma STEMI or, or stroke alert, sepsis alert, um, but it also is, is asking medics to verify the receiving status and make sure that they can do that, either checking with dispatch, checking with sort of things so that we don't get these, because you know what's happened is, is uh, STEMI patients or stroke patients who show up in facilities that can't, can't manage them because have the, the CT scanners down or the cath labs closed. And then the other thing we added was really more for hospitals around this, um, which is any planned service outage and or outage expected to last within 12 hours must also be communicated by email and phone call to SCEMSA uh, and ensure communication status to all stakeholders. So for hospitals, if they're being a big model of a cath lab or they know it's going to be down more than a couple hours, that has to be a more formal notification. So there's a higher level of alert or notification of the system that this, this facility is going to be. Uh, closed for a while. Well, um, it is Thursday of EMS week. Uh, I want to take this chance if, uh, to wish you, Hernando, a uh, happy EMS week um, and all of our providers as well. Absolutely. Same here. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Absolutely. So if you're watching this during EMS week, happy EMS week from Dr. Garzone and I. If it's after EMS week, heck, Happy belated EMS week. Um, but thanks for joining me, Hernando. This is great. I love when we do these videos together and I really think it helps all of our providers. And, uh, and I appreciate your time today and uh, we'll, see you, we'll see you next time.